as well. Today we want to talk about uh, another area of change, a needed change, and that's the role of women's participation within Papua New Guinea society. Uh, there are, across the developed wor developing world, about 18% of women in the parliaments of the developing world. The figure within the Pacific is much less. It's about 5%. And in PNG, prior to this year's election, only four women had served in the national parliament, and we're going to hear from one of those a bit later. There are, evidently, significant barriers to women participating in politics, and we need to do what we can to support women's uh, empowerment in that process. And it is important to do that because women bring different perspectives to the political process. Uh, we see that within our own country. But it seems to me that where you find a country with empowered women is where you find a country which is developing fast. And that's why it is so important that we see the empowerment of women throughout the Pacific and PNG and why we want to play our role in supporting uh, the Pacific and PNG in moving down that path. And we've done that through our own Prime Minister's announcement of the gender initiative uh, during the Pacific Island Forum earlier this year. At this election in Papua New Guinea, we saw the election for the first time of three women in the parliament, which is a great moment in the history of PNG. Uh, Lujaya Tony, who is now uh, the Minister for Community Development in PNG, the, the successor to Dame Carroll. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting or seeing Lujaya again when I was in PNG a couple of weeks ago. Julie Soso, uh, who is the Governor of the Eastern Highlands Province, and Delilah Gore. Um, their election is a critical moment in the future of Papua New Guinea. But I, uh, but I want to end on this point. Their election is because of our guest tonight, or this afternoon. Their election is because of uh, the inspiration that has been given to those women, and indeed women throughout PNG and the Pacific, by Dame Carol Kidu, who for many years carried the flame alone in terms of women's empowerment within PNG and indeed within the Pacific. She is a hero. Uh, she is one of Australia's greatest exports. Um, and we are so delighted uh, to have her here today as our orator. I won't go on because uh, Senator Anne McEwen is going to do the formal introduction, but please uh, enjoy the main course, and after it, we will be returning with our, uh, our 2012 PNG Independence Day. Uh, Dame Carroll was born in Brisbane, and when she was 16, she fell in love at a school camp on the Gold Coast with a young Papua New Guinean man who was on a scholarship at Toowoomba Grammar School. And that man, young man's name was Buri Kidu. They went to study together at the University of Queensland, and they married and moved to Papua New Guinea. Buri became Chief Justice in 1980, but sadly is no longer with us. Following his passing, Dame Carroll committed to PMG and formed the Sir Buri Hart Institute. After much deliberation, she successfully contested the 1997 general election, winning the seat of Port Moresby South, and she was re-elected in 2002 and 2007. From 2002 until her retirement this year, Dame Kidu was the only woman in PNG's parliament. And aren't we gl glad to hear that there's been more women elected to the PNG parliament in the most recent elections. Dame Kidu was appointed Minister for Community Development in 2002 and held that position until the dramatic events of August 2011. And as Minister, she was at the forefront in the fight against domestic violence and HIV AIDS. In 2012, in the midst of a turbulent period in PNG politics, Dame Kidu emerged as PNG's only opposition member, making her the first female opposition leader in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and we will remember those pictures of Dame Carroll sitting by herself on the opposition benches. In 2012, after a long and immensely productive career in politics, Dame Kidu retired, but as we've heard from discussions uh, with her today, she's uh, hardly in retirement and still has much work to do. Dame Kidu has been recognised with the highest honours for her service. In 2005, she was made Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire for services to community and politics. In 2007, she received the US Secretary of State's International Women of Courage Award. In 2009, she was made a Knight of the Legion of Honour by France for her dedication to helping women, young girls, children, the physically and mentally impaired, and her commitment 
and for her commitment to fighting discrimination. She was the first citizen of Papua New Guinea ever to receive that important award. She has also received three honorary doctorates, two from Papua New Guinea universities and one from the University of Queensland. What an extraordinary life and achievement. It's my great honour to introduce to you Dame Carol Kiddu. Thank you, Senator. Um, we obviously have something in common. Both of you fell in love with Papua New Guinea. I fell in love with a man <laughs> on first sight, and it's changed my life for, forever. Um, and I'm thinking about those things you observed in 2000 and when you were there. What was it? Two, six. And I'm trying to think how many of them are still sustainable. A couple are, but many are not. And perhaps that's going to be part of what I'm going to talk about today, this great challenge of sustainable development at community level in Papua New Guinea. And I'm going to uh, touch on to that as well. As is the tradition, since the historic apology to Indigenous Australians by Honourable Kevin Rudd, I acknowledge the traditional elders past and present of the land that we are gathered on. I also acknowledge my extended family of the Vahoi clan of Pari village and the people of Moresby South Electorate in Papua New Guinea. It is because of their support with three elections that I am privileged to be here today. I owe them great gratitude and support. Honorable Richard Miles, Parliamentary Secretary for Pacific Island Affairs, members of Parliament, Senators, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, or may I simply say friends, because I see many familiar faces here today and soon I will start to relax and that knot in my stomach will disappear, I hope. <laughs> I'm very honoured to deliver the second PNG Independence Oration following former Prime Minister Sir Rabin Amalu's inaugural oration last year. And I in thoroughly endorse his commendation to Honourable Richard Miles for initiating this occasion as an annual event to continue to cement the relationships between our two countries. The invitation letter asked me to speak about women in politics in Papua New Guinea. My initial reaction was, oh no, not again. <laughs> so I will take the liberty to comment on other social development issues as well, and I've called my oration Women in po Politics in Papua New Guinea Plus, with a big plus on it. So I hope you'll accept that. It is certainly important to celebrate the fact that we now have three women in Parliament in Papua New Guinea. A minister, a vice minister and a governor, representing three different regions of the country, the northern, the southern and the highlands. So that in itself was another coup. We are hoping it marks the beginning of an attitudinal change which will be sustained and increased in future elections. But we are also mindful of the fact that several of our Pacific neighbours actually lost female numbers in recent elections. And we do not want that to happen in Papua New Guinea. PNG has a long way to go before we reach the Commonwealth minimum standard of one-third female participation in Parliament. And that in itself is below the 50% benchmark being achieved in Pacific French territories under the French political parity laws passed in 2000, which took effect in 2008. I know that one woman in Parliament of 109, 0.9%, not even 1%, it was not enough. And three women in Parliament of Papua New Guinea, although a brilliant achievement by those three women, is still far from enough. And the push to implement national government gender policy on equality and participation must continue in some form or another. It is not about quality alone. We now have three Papua New Guinean women of substance in Parliament. And post-independence, we had two pioneer female politicians, one being a minister with Dame Josephine and uh, Naharuni. But politics, as you all know sitting here, is about quantity as well as quality. It comes down to, critical, to numbers when it comes to some critical issues. And that critical mass is needed for women to influence the political culture of Papua New Guinea. So a battle has been won. But the war is still not over, but it's not a war. It's a friendly dialogue to improve, improve the numbers. I thank the Australian government through AusAid support and the UN agencies for the technical and financial support given to the women's political lobby over the last five years. 
And in particular, I thank the Gender Reference Group, Papua New Guinean women and men who committed to the preparation of the Equality and Participation Bill, as well as the policy framework, of which the constitutional amendment was successfully passed. So we have that basic amendment in our constitution. Although the Enabling Organic Bill was defeated, which I knew would happen, because I knew the feelings about that particular piece of legislation, I am sure that the continuous public debate for five years contributed to changing the attitude that seems to be emerging now in Papua New Guinea, and so we must keep moving forward. It is good that the lobby for affirmative action is continuing, and the election diagnostic for 2012, conducted by UN Women with AusAid financial support, is well underway. Its findings, which are in draft form, will help define the way ahead. One thing that is clear from the diagnostic so far is that women who want to stand in 2017 should start their preparations now. Many started too late. The concept of reserved seats has been rejected by the new female MPs, and I must say that before I was in politics and when I was first there, I didn't really fancy the concept of reserved seats either. So the way forward needs to include increased focus on political party commitment as well as on developing sk political skills for women at local, ward, and provincial levels to dramatically increase political participation of women at those levels as a foundation for entry into national politics. Perhaps affirmative party action alone will not be enough to make the critical mass change that we need in Papua New Guinea. So we're going to have to be created, creative in trying to define an, an organic law that will be acceptable um, to the majority in Parliament. The sad thing, and I have to say this, in all of this, is that although both governments, that of Sir Michael Somari and that of Peter O'Neill in the last parliament, made bold statements about equality and participation being core policies, neither committed any budget to pursue the policy objectives. Thus, it was necessary for me to turn to development partners for funding of a variety of programs as, as well as attempts at legislative reform. Noble policy statements without budgets are toothless tigers. And when one seeks funding elsewhere to give some teeth to the tiger, accusations of foreign agendas often emerge. So it is something that we really must address, the fact that we have to commit budget-wise as well, well as noble statements in policies. The continuing lack of in-country funding remains a threat to other social programs, as well as those for political participation of women. One such area of programming is in the area of maternal and sexual and reproductive health rights. PNG has not tracked well on the MDGs, and our maternal mortality rate actually increased, as you well know, between 1996 and 2006 demographic health surveys. On average, five women die every day in Papua New Guinea from pre pregnancy-related health uh, complications. This fact galvanized efforts to produce a ministerial report on maternal health during the la eighth term of parliament. While the department has, has busied itself with restructuring to establish national and provincial command posts to improve, improve service delivery and data collection, our development partners have fully funded some aspects of the response. The midwifery, midwifery project to address the critical sort shortage of midwives and the aging work workforce in that area is fully funded by AusAid and as a team of eight midwifery teachers and two obstetricians, I've been privileged to meet them on several occasions when they're in-country working. It is coming up to one year of a two-year initial funding phase and has shown notable improvements in the quality of teaching and the profile of new graduates. Scholarships PNG has enabled, and again that's an AusAid funded project, has enabled increased numbers of funded placements with 80 this year and 130 next year, improving uh, our midwives. There are now four midwifery schools fully functional. And as family planning is the most effective way to reduce maternal mortality, it is essential that it has high support, visibility, and advocacy within the project. I quote from Professor Pat Brody, the midwifery advisor and mentor to the team, initiatives like ours are good, are a good start, but it will only be effective within a functioning health system and a whole of government approach, starting with community preparedness. Professor Brody and I have often discussed the preparation of community preparedness materials for safe motherhood, plus a couple of other people in this room. Um, one of many things I hope to be involved with in, in life after politics. Community preparedness, community engagement, community empowerment, community mobilization. It can be called many things. C 
community is fundamental but, but a neglected foundation stone to sustainable development in Papua New Guinea and in many countries. We are all aware of the critical capacity problems with service delivery in Papua New Guinea. It is something that present government and the former government are continuously working on because it's recognized as a major issue. The public service machinery, while struggling to respond to the needs of the increased population, has been further weakened for over a decade by brain drain, often to places like Ozone, inadequate budgets, and by politicization and parallel projects funded under the DSIP grants to members of parliament. The potential power of the resilience of communities to partner with the public service has been largely untapped by successive governments. To, um, and the new integrated community de development policy is struggling to partner effectively with the churches and NGOs. And I'm really pleased that Minister Lujaya Tony has said she, she will continue to pursue this integrated community development policies. There is great opportunity for programs like the church um, partnership program to work with this integrated community development policy to maximize potential impact of community-based projects and at the same time strengthen government capacity to facilitate development processes in the community because government must be seen at community level otherwise it weakens government. I often feel that PNG has taken off at an incredible speed but we have failed to pick up the majority of the passengers. We are really moving. There's such a, we're such a blessed country with so many resources and so many major impact projects being signed off. But sometimes we wonder whether, whether we've left some of the passengers belong. And they've remained on the ground struggling with the complex interface between tradition and modernity, often marginalized from the main flight path for a variety of reasons that are not the fault of government necessarily. So I'm not being critical here of government. Should we just see this as the price of progress, or should we devise programs to facilitate analytical reflection to help citizens define their pathways to more prosperous futures? Is it just fanciful thinking uh, that that is possible in a nation of such diversity? I believe that it, it has to be part of the way forward if we as communities and a nation are going to truly take ownership of the future. Let me illustrate further by drawing on the white ribbon campaign issues of violence against women. And I was pleased to attend the uh, activities in Parliament yesterday here. The violence being experienced by women in Papua New Guinea is well documented and completely unacceptable. But is it traditional? Certainly children growing up today possibly see it as a norm of Papua New Guinea. And that is a very dangerous self-perpetuating cycle that is now being established. But in a society I married into, such physical violence in the family was not traditional and not acceptable. Perhaps more common was psychological violence and disempowering language that devalues women and discourages women from aspiring to leadership. And this also is a, a, an issue that must be addressed. For example, said to my daughter a year after her father died by some of the elders when she tried to speak at, at, her, at the funeral one year anniversary. She went outside and sat down and wept. She said, Mum, Dad would never have said to them that, Bas Yohera, don't speak. You are only a woman. You have no right. And it was said to her by some of the elders. This type of thing that disempowers young girls. We must address these things as well because if you hear that as a child, you will believe it. Lateral violence is also a powerful negative force in communities and particularly amongst women and again can discourage women's aspirations for their future and it is a constraint to sustainable development. And I believe that lateral violence, which is quite common in communal codependent societies, it needs to be looked at and addressed is that whole, in our total approach to the violence we're seeing in Papua New Guinea today. Of course, physical violence requires urgent and immediate action, but other forms of violence also require analytical analysis because they contribute to the underlying causes of violence. Discouraging language that incites violence also needs to be factored into many response programs. Often this language comes from women and was used traditionally to incite the men into warfare. Akas em got shame em. Has your ex ashamed? If the ex is taken up, it must draw blood. Is it a shame that it's not drawn? And, and these things are said via language that incites violence that incited the, the position to a tribal fighting. We must start 
trying to get these things out of the language of the culture of the country to um, move forward in, in, in discouraging violence. Programs to address violence against women need to explore multiple responses to fill the vacuum created by the loss of cultural protective customs. There's a wonderful one that I, can't, that I saw in my early years there where a girl was physically protected by the mothers-in-law. Literally, they got up as her protectors and protected her. I've never seen it since. And the inadequacies, inadequacies of legal and institutional responses to violence, we need to dig further and we need to unpack the whole issue very thoroughly. Related to violence is the high levels of stress in families and communities. We don't talk about stress much in Papua New Guinea because there are so many other issues. We talk about it a lot in Australia. Um, health issues of emotional and social well-being have very little focus in our health system. Under 1% of the health budget goes towards the issue of the mental well-being of our people. There are too many other issues demanding attention. Maternal infant mortality, HIV epidemic, the emergence of multiple drug-resistant strains of TB, the rapid increase in lifestyle, re lifestyle, lifestyle result, result, related M NCDs, they're all stretching the institutional capacity to, res to respond, and it's gone beyond the limit. However, when the North Queensland Mental Health Specialist decided to hold their Creating Futures 2012 conference in Port Moresby with Professor Hunter and a combination with our mental health people, this neglected area of health gained quite a boost. It was wonderful seeing these empowered mental health workers throughout the country there feeling such a boost. Stress and anger management need attention, as do substance abuse and addic addictive behavior. The church health system is perhaps the best starting point to expand these health issues. Some interesting modeling is already well advanced in Manus Island where Dr. Quinton Riley, a former health secretary, has established a mindfulness meditation retreat in his wife's village as he moves between his work in mental health in Cairns and in Manus. The positive impact on academic results for school students in the area is now being monitored and documented. Dr. Riley and I are presently looking at ways to introduce this work to the, f to the fractured Port Moresby Society and to the high stress environment of our senior bureaucrats, etc. Just two days ago, I was with our acting chief ombudsman, Phoebe, a, a wonderful woman, discussing this, and she was very affirmative that we should try to move forward. Too many of our young people are dying from heart attacks in their, in their, 90, in their late 40s. I would like to also just explore a bit, do I have time? The issue of poverty and culture a little bit. Most writings on poverty, and I've read Professor Sachs' book on the, to the end of poverty, they examine the socioeconomic issues but fail to recognize the cultural influences on poverty and inequity. Perhaps it, culturally it is almost impossible to achieve the national goal of equitable development in Papua New Guinea. There is definitely ethnic tension in Papua New Guinea around the issue of resource development and sometimes resentment by coastal people against some highland groups who are more aggressive culturally. And this is not about right or wrong, good or bad, it's just different. As a member of an urban electorate for 15 years, a melting pop pot of tribes learning to become one people, one nation in the capital city, I watched these resentments simmer until often small incident would bring them to a boiling point and an explosion with violent clashes, deaths, injuries, and property, property destruction followed by compensation gatherings and then back to a simmering in a cycli cyclic pattern. We are aiming to be one people, one nation, and there are fundamental commonalities and differences that can either unite or divide us. And we need to understand these as a people. One difference is attitudes to work ethic. My observation, and I, I don't know the Highland culture as well, but my observation is that Highland cultures are based on competitive and continuous productivity to create big men in the tribe. Papuan tribes where leadership was inherited through chieftainships, continuous competitive productivity was not the norm. In fact, it was avoided. And so there's really a dis imbalance there and neither one right or wrong. Papuans often stereotyped as lazy, work very hard, and they can be very hard working, to fulfill communal cultural obligations such as funeral and bride price and church obligations. But between these obligations, the fear of jealousy, sorcery, and even death often discourages them from standing out 
from the communal norm and trying to advance as entrepreneurs. Just three weeks ago, we buried a brother-in-law, just 49 years. Medically, he was type 2 diabetic who suffered a silent heart attack. But culturally, it is believed the underlying cause was sorcery because of jealousy, no matter what. <laughs> the Highland cultures, based on entrepreneurship, adopted, adapted very quickly to Western capitalism, whereas some other tribes have been trapped in a cultural time warp that exacerbates poverty. Being married into a non-entrepreneurial culture, I keep challenging me, myself with the question, how can we design business development models that adapt to the different cultures to create at least a minimal situation of sufficiency rather than increasing poverty? It's something that I want to struggle with now that I'm out of that madhouse called politics. Because there must be ways we can develop, um, develop um, business models that can draw on culture, the different cultural aspects. The increasing me culture of individualism and teaching little children to saying, it is my right to have a healthy mother, it is my right. And I say, what a beautiful song. Then I go to the teacher and I say, would you please teach them to sing, it is our right to have healthy mothers. It is our right to have an education. Just this little thing changing psychology from a communal codependent society to a very individualistic based society my right, but what about that kid over there in the gutter? We've got to be very careful how we, uh, how we move forward accepting all of these things that we're taking on. This individual of in communal rights to resources such as land also challenges me to think about the processes and impacts of change. How can we decrease the feminization of poverty by ensuring access to resources and land for women and debunking the myth I repeat, debunking the myths that women had no land rights in Papua New Guinea. We all know that many, there were some cultures that were matrilineal, but even in the patrilineal culture that I married into, there were rights. I reflect on the 1960s and the to the 1980s, when we were still practicing shifting cultivation on traditional land on the outskirts of Port Moresby. Each year, the male clan leader would be out there, and we'd all be gathered as a clan, and he would start allocating the land. Where, where the blocks are allocated to men? No. <coughs> Announcements would be made. Dobi sinane natano, Dobi's mother's land. Gaudi sinane natano, Gaudi's mother's land. And uh, after all of it, uh, my late mother-in-law would oversee that she was widowed, would oversee the management of all the gardens. The women were named. But what has happened to those very clear user rights of women today? It's very convenient to forget those things. Individual main ca male clan leaders negotiate the leasing and sale of land and alienate women and families, and particularly women, from their means of livelihood without legal protection for future generations. Widows and, and, married, and women married outside the village are being denied access to land and being forced into, depend into dependence and poverty. In fact, the latest urban demographic analysis for the National Capital District has clearly shown that the poorest of the poor in the capital city of Port Moresby are the traditional landowners and the original settlers who were brought to Port Moresby during colonial times to be laborers. It's a very sobering thought. The third and fourth generation settlers who are now sometimes alienated from their traditional village support base and yet many of the development partner and NGO projects do not target the poorest of the poor in the city. I am aware that I am rambling on with reflections, many of which may appear negative, so it is time to bring some conclusions to these reflections. Although they may appear negative, they are not intended to be. They merely illustrate that modernization is a thin veneer over the surface of thousands of years of cultural diversity. The interface between the many indigenous tribes and between tradition and modernity is not an easy interface. How can we get the best of many worlds for our people? We all know there have been disappointing progress in Papua New Guinea in the social field. Economically, we are booming. Much, despite much in-country effort and overseas development assistance, the reality is that the socio social indicators remain low by regional and, and international standards, and social disparity is increasing. Major major issues remain impediments to sustainable development, but we need to acknowledge and strengthen the family and the community as the foundation of the nation. 
We need to provide knowledge and skills for families to become economically viable, to take ownership of their futures, to ensure at least sufficiency for all and, prosper and prosperity for some. We need to strengthen belief systems based on trust and personal empowerment and discourage the belief systems based on fear and criticism. There are endless stories of dysfunction from this interface. How can we rethink service delivery to reach beyond the formal systems and into the margins of the rural majority and the urban poor? The policies do exist, focusing on community, integrated community development policy, community-based disability policies, early childhood policies, informal economy policies, small and medium enterprise policies, microfinance policies, and they are increasing as governments become more aware of this crisis at our community level. Our challenge is how to roll out the implementation process in partnership with the churches and the NGOs and our developer partners, not parallel partnerships, but integrated partnerships. The, the churches and the NGOs know better are the best implementers at community level, but government must take more interest in that level. We need to rethink development and accept that just and lasting change can only be achieved when communities own their future. Mobilization should start from national leadership, but sustainability depends on continuing community participation. Laws, policies, structural reform, and budgeted development programs are essential, but are not enough even when they become institutionalized. Laws and policies alone sometimes do not change reality, even with a strong bureaucracy. In the final outcome, the solutions begin and end in civil society, and we must strengthen our civil society, which tends to be a rather fractured civil society. Let me end with a quote from Albert Einstein, so I sound a little bit academic. Uh. Albert Einstein said, setting an example is not the main means of influencing others. It is the only means. That is the leadership challenge for us all. And may I be a little bit frivolous and invite you all to join the Mad Cat team. I've got mad cats in Vulavinaka country. I've got mad cats all around the place. And who are the Mad Cat team? They are people who believe in possibility thinking. We must believe it is possible. They want to be mad and make a difference. As cats change agent trainers by recognizing that in a team, together, everyone achieves more. So we must take Papua New Guinea forward with a team of mad cats. Thank you.